Uspi, am I right? He's going to talk about viscoelastic tides. Okay. okay, first of all, thank you very much for Andrea Poo. I'm also happy to see Francisco here attending the lecture. Uh, so I'll talk about tides. Uh, so just the summary of my talk. Uh, first of all, I will just explain some basics about tides, maybe some, thing, some curiosities about it. Uh, first of all, why do tides occur? Uh, the, earth, the, the whole Earth rotation in, in, in our perception of tide, so there are two comp main components, the semi-journal and journal tides. Then I will discuss about tides from the point of view of celestial mechanics because if, this is a very complex subject. So you can think about the, the ocean tides. You know, that's important for, you know, for the entering of ships in harbors but I will not be interested on, on particularly on ocean tides. I, I will be interested in the overall tides. So the tides that affect the oceans and also the solid part of the Earth. So I'm interested in tides from a celestial mechanics point of view. Then I will discuss a little bit about the model I, 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 I built up for, for studying tides. So I will just introduce the variables of the model, the types of energy that must be considered in analyzing the model, and the geology of, of, of the celestial body we are dealing, dealing with. And finally, I will present some conclusions. So first thing I would like to address is why do tides occur? Well, they occur at the Earth, for instance, because the Earth is not a point mass. So this is a, although we usually model the Earth as a point mass for celestial mechanics studies, the Earth is an extended body. So I would like to explain this because uh, although it's very well known, it's not completely trivial why we have this figure. You know. the, the satellite is there, the, the moon, for instance, the, the Earth is here, and you have the, this, this, the formation of the Earth. So it's deformed, it's, it's stretched in this direction. And the reason is the following. Here's the Earth, and here's the Moon, model as a point mass. So essentially, when we think about, when we, th when we model the force that the, the Moon acts upon the Earth, we think about the force that the Moon acts at the center of the Earth. So, so this is the, essentially what we, 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 we call about this force. But since the Earth is, a, is an extended body, and the, and the gravity potentials and the gravity forces, it decreases with the distance. In fact, at this point of the Earth, we have a force that is, let me do it a little bit smaller, this one. A little bit, it's a little bit larger than the force that acts up on, at the center of the Earth. And the, force that acts at this part of, of the Earth, it's farther away from the Moon than this one. It's a little bit smaller. Here we have a, something similar. So we have a, this force has a direction that's different from this one. The same happens here. And if we make the difference, now we take this, the average force, let us say, and put it here, here, and here, and here, the difference, let me see if I find this, the difference that we find is like this. And you see, the force of the center, it's larger than here. So the, the arrow, the difference here is in this direction, and the difference here is in this direction. So, so essentially, what it's plotted here is this difference, and, and this force field just stretches the, the, the Earth in the direction of the satellite. This is the reason, and although it looks very simple, this, right? The, the, the ancient people in, 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 in uh, the time of Christ knew, they observed that the tides were related to the moon, for instance, but they could not understand why there was a high tide when the moon was on the right, is, is in the direction of, uh, of, of 
of the observer and a high tide in the opposite direction. They thought it was a little you know, strange. The, the, more, the most natural, in fact, uh, the most natural thing to, to, to expect in these situations. Just the ancient people. You ask a bunch of modern people why there's two tides a day. They give you lots of complicated descriptions. Of tides a day. Well, I, I myself, you know, to be, I, 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 I have been studying <laughs> tides, you know. But when I was even a, a, an undergraduate student, probably I didn't know about the explanation. I knew that it was related to this. But anyway, but the explanation, and Newton gave this explanation. Isaac Newton was the first person who really understood that and explained this. this. So it was a, a big issue in, in Newton's theory to explain why do we have two high tides uh, like this in, in 24 hours and not only one. But rotation plays a very important role in this, in, the, in, this, in, this, in this business. Because what happens here? So let's see. Uh, I will explain now that this, how I say, this intuitive notion of having only one high tide per, in each 24 hours is not completely stupid. Because there is this relation of, of uh, the rotation of the Earth and the tide. Because let's. First, talk about the semi-diurnal tide. Exactly, the semi-diurnal tide is exactly this. You have the, the, the period of the tides is, is, is semi-diurnal, uh, each 12 hours. So what happens here is the phone. You have the moon, you have the Earth. So the, the, the Earth is stretched in this direction, the direction of the moon. But it is rotating. So if you're here, here near the equator, for instance, in Rio de Janeiro, at, at noon, and the, the, uh, at midnight, let's see, and the moon is exactly on, on, on the top of your head, and then after 12 hours, this midnight at noon, you'll be here. So you'll see the high tide at midnight and the high tide at noon. Here, 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., you see the, the low tides. This is the semi-journal tide, the, the very well known. This, this picture I just showed you before. But there's another component, the journal tides. And the journal tides, I will explain with the other figures the following. How can we understand it? The moon. It's not always on the equator, right, of, of the Earth. Sometimes it's, it's you know, on, on, at high latitudes on, on the sky. And so that picture, the red formation, is in this direction. So suppose now we don't leave, we are not in Rio, but we are in, in, in Norway, in Tromso, high latitude, this place, for instance. There is a stereotype. But you see, here, for instance, suppose you are here at this point at, at midnight or, or at noon. So you have a, a low tide. 20, 12 hours after this, you'll be here at this point where you see the high tide. And then 12 hours again after you, you are in the low tide. So you're not seeing the, the high tides each 12 hours, but at each 12 hours. Each 24 hours. So this is the diurnal component of the tide. Did you, did you understand this? Not a, a very obvious picture. See, again, it's the deformation. The same deformation I, I draw. But now the moon is not on the equator, right? It happens because the orbit of the moon, is, there's a, a plane here, an inclination plane. So and the, the moon is rotating. It's a complicated. The orbit of the moon is, is quite complicated. Anyway, but anyway, but the moon is here. So, yeah, and so the, the, the Earth is stretching this direction. The Earth is rotating. So, 12, it's rotating. So after 12 hours, you'll be this side. And then again, and you see, if you, if you see the, the height of the tide here is large, here is small. So you see a, 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 a no, high tides every 12 hours in this situation. You're not in the equator. In the equator, you see, you, you still see every 12 hours a, a tide. So this is related to the rotation and the latitude. It's, 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 a, it's a different mode of the tide. And moreover, I am not discussed this, but if the Earth, the axis of rotation of the Earth, was, were directed towards the moon, you see, this figure is like the Earth rotating with respect to this axis. Of course, this never happens. But then we would, we would not see the deformation would, would still exist. But it will call the permanent tide because we will not notice it. 
This happens to the moon, for instance. The moon, you know, it's, it's, it's locked to the sun, to the earth. So the, 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 the earth, uh, the force, the, the tidal force, forcing of the earth upon the moon causes a tide, but it's the moon, for the moon, it's, it's a steady tide, right? It's a permanent tide. Is it clear that? So have this, so tides have this, that there's this composition of the, 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 the force of the, 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 the Tidal forcing and the rotation of, of, of the planet, or in the case of the Earth, that you know. So tides tides are, are, are quite complicated, particularly ocean tides. That depends also on the on the geography, on the topography of the bottom, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, so this is just to sh to show that you know the rotation is very important here, and and, and the position of of the planet of the forcing body, the, the moon or the sun. But now let's talk about tides from the point of view of celestial mechanics. As I said, uh, the, the tides can be very complicated, particularly ocean tides, to describe, to model. But let's see if you're interested in, 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 in celestial mechanics model. So the things simplify a lot. Why? Uh, because, first of all, well, the Earth is not a point mass. And the, the idea of my model is the following. The Earth is not a point mass. but from a mathematical perspective, I would like it to be, because it's very convenient to work with, with point masses. And it's very difficult to work with extended bodies. So I, I want to compute, to, to make a model where we, we include some new effects due to the, 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 the size of the Earth, but not abandon the point mass uh, perspective. So first of all, large celestial bodies are almost spherical, stars and planets. And the reason, well, the reason is the force of gravity that dominates over all other forces. So the gravitational field have larger monopole components. So the, 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 the gravitational field of the sun or of the Earth is essentially is the point mass gravitational field. It's like a, a delta of Dirac of mass here, and then you have the potential that's 1 over r. But since it's ex an extended body and, and, and the deformed body, for instance, like the, the, the Earth that is it has a flattening on the poles. It also has a quadrupole moment component, which decays faster. While the monopole component or the point mass has a potential decays as 1 over r, the quadrupole component decays of 1 over r to the cube, and even has, of course, much more, more multiple components. But we don't care about that, because usually we only take this first approximation to in many of the celestial mechanics studies, especially when you have many bodies. So one of our cubes is already a, 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 a big improvement. Uh, moreover, since the self-gravitational force is very intense, the deformation caused, caused by tides is very small. So uh, celestial bodies. They, they're almost spherical, and when they deform, they are, they are usually ellipsoidal bodies with a, have an ellipsoidal shape with, a, with small eccentricities. And, and moreover, to describe this, this small eccentricity, uh, this ellipsoidal shape, you can use the moment of quadrupole tensor. It's essentially the, the moment of, of quadrupole of, of an ellipsoid. So you can encode this ellipticity of the planets due to the formation using the moment of quadrupole. Moreover, and this is a very important thing, that in fact this model, it started, it, it, when we, I and my former student, we, we, we did it. This was uh, something that I didn't know, I didn't know, and it was very important for us. It's the following. The moment of quadrupole tensor is equal to the trace last part of the moment of inertia tensor. And this, well, this is well known. The physicists, many, they know this, but uh, well, not all physicists, but anyway, but many physicists know this. It's particular those people working in this field. But since I'm not, uh, I was not working in this field before. I didn't know that. But because this links immediately the gravitational interaction to the rotation part, and I said that the gravitation and the rotation are the two important issues in this in this in this business. So, so this was this is a very important point. And, and, and another one that's very interesting is the following, is this theorem by George Darwin, the, the son of, of, of Charles Darwin, that says the following. If you have an incompressible body, 
right? And it, you deform it. Doesn't matter if in an ellipsoidal shape or not any other shape. The trace of the moment of inertia does not change in, with the deformation. The, the other components, of course, change, but not the trace. So, so the trace is, is, is remains constant. Well, so in, in the model we, we constructed, we use the following variables. First of all, the position of the center of the mass of the body to describe the translation of the body as we do in, in usually point mass celestial mechanics. This is the, uh, the obvious thing. The traceless part of the moment of inertia tensor that characterizes the body deformation. In other words, I will not care about, for example, take the Earth. Highly complicated. You have the tides of the, 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 the sea, the, the ocean tides, the atmospheric tides, the solid part tides. The solid part is very complicated because has a solid part has this, this mantle. It's a complicated business. It has a, a solid core. You see, if, if you think about this, all these heterogeneities of the Earth, you get crazy about that. So I, I forget about everything. And, and, and for me, the shape of the Earth is, 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 is completely characterized by this, this, the moment of inertia tensor, the traceless part, in fact, because the, 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 the trace is, is constant. It's a property of the Earth, right? You can, you can get it from the books, the, 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 what they call the, the, the inertia tensor of the Earth, the trace of it. Uh, and finally, I need another variable. This is more complicated. Maybe I will skip the explanation now because it's, uh, although it's, it's well known, I, I didn't do this, but it's uh, the most complicated to understand because you need an average orientation of the body to describe the rotation of the body. And this is the most complicated part because it's a deformable body. If you have a rigid body, you have the Zweller's equation, it's easy because then you, 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 you fix the, 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 the reference frame to the body and then the, the, the body carries the reference frame. So you use this to describe the, pose, the, angle, the, the orientation of the body. But if you have the formable body, if you think about it, it's not easy to, to put a reference frame on this body. It's deforming, right? If you, you put one axis in, in, in Greenwich, another in Sao Paulo, another one, whatever. But, you know, but these points, we are moving with respect to each other. It's very little, but, but this is the whole business here, right? You want to... to Keep track of this motion. So what you do is the following. It's called the Stisham frame. You, you define, in principle, you can compute the angular moment of the body, integrating you know, the velocity and the distribution of mass of all particles of the body. And then you can compute the inertia tensor of the body that changes with time, too, with respect to the inertial reference frame, because the body is deforming. And with these two quantities, you, you use this formula, use this formula here. Moment, angular moment is this inertia tensor times omega to define an angular velocity. You enter with this angular velocity, you have an orientation. And this is, let's call an average orientation. And this construction is, 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 is uh, the so-called t frame that's very well explained in, by, in a book by Jeffries uh, from the 90, from 1930s or 40s, I don't remember. Anyway, well, the good thing about this is the following. Now I have only 11 degrees of freedom. Three degrees of freedom relate to the position of the center of mass. Five degrees of freedom, because this is the trace. I'm using the components of the traceless part of the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia is a, is a six by three by three symmetric matrix. So it has six independent coefficients. But then you, you take the trace that is constant. You get only, only five remains. And finally, you have this, oh, I'm sorry. You have three degrees of freedom, the rotation degrees of freedom, right? And then what I use to, to construct uh, the equations of motion, I use a, a, a Lagrangian modeling, a Lagrangian formulas with dissipation function. So I, so I need to consider all the energies that are important. So I have a kinetic energy due translation rotation. The obvious, right? I have now an angular velocity. I have an inertia tensor due the, the, the inertia, the, the, the angular, the kinetic energy of due to rotations. The translation energy, uh, kinetic energy is just the mass times the velocity of the center of mass. Then I have the kinetic energy due to deformations. That may be negligible. A big issue also. We, we, we're still working on this now, and, uh, but it, in, 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 in some situations it may be negligible. Then we have the self-gravitational potential. That's easy, very easy. The potential energy due to gravitational interaction, again, very easy. And then we have two other objects that are more complicated. The elastic internal energy. It depends on the halogen of the body. If the body is a fluid body, it's a solid body, it's a mixed 
mixture of, of both, like the Earth, that has a solid part, a liquid part. And then we have an energy dissipation function due to viscous forces that also uh, complicate the object because it depends on the hydrology of the body. Just to give you an idea, the case of the Earth. The case of the Earth is to take the viscosity of granite, the viscosity of the interior of the Earth, it's, it's, it's a completely crazy idea because it's not very intuitive, but when the, the, the tides of the Earth, they form everything, the solid part and the oceans, etc., etc. But Almost all energy dissipated by the tides are dissipated on the ocean, in the ocean. Like 95% of the, the overall energy dissipation due to tides on the Earth is, occurs on the oceans. And moreover, occurs in particular part, in certain parts of the ocean, most of them. So, so it's a very, see, it's a very uh, tricky thing. Anyway, but anyway, but if you, I want to con construct a, 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 a realistic model, I have to take into account this. Anyway, but after I do this, if I, in general, this, this, this four terms here, no, there's not, not much discussion about them, it's easy. These two are, are, are more, you know, is on the, on the, where the physics lives, you know. The physics is, is that remains to be done is related to these two last energies here. So anyway, but after you have all this, then you do a question of Mercer orbiting within the Lagrangian framework of mechanics. You do, you just the, the usual computations, and you get equations of motion. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Great. So, uh, so first of all, I'm not constructing a toy model. Every, because I gave this talk to other people, right? <laughs> and they look at me, you know. This is so complex. You're reducing to the, I'm not constructing a toy model. Many people in this business are, but I'm not. I'm constructing a realistic problem. So I want to compare the results with measure results. And this is the reason that everybody, I know many astronomers, I'm working with them now. Then they say, well, let's work with which planet? A new planet that we discovered you know, in the other galaxy. And I know where they want to, why they want to, to work with this planet. Because they know anything about it. Anything they can write, it's OK for them. I said, no, let's work with the Earth. But they say, the Earth is very complicated. It has oceans. Has, we know all the complications, but that's OK. But for the Earth, we have data. <laughs> we have very good data. It's amazing the amount of data we have for the Earth, and including for the tides. Why? Because they, they want to, to, this GPS that we use all the time, they require very good knowledge of the orientation of the Earth. And the, and the Earth does not rotate uniformly during the day. Because you see, we have tides. When you, you, as you know, when the ballerina opens the arm, right, the angular velocity decreases, right? And the Earth is the same. When the, the tides change the angular, the, the, the inertia moment tensor of the Earth, they also decrease. It's milliseconds, microseconds, but it, they, they, they have a model for that. And they measure it using these very precise clocks they have. So for the Earth, this. So what he did, I and my, my former student, we took, we took the data of the Earth. It, it gave us a, a terrible headache to understand the data. But it's published. You have big data files that you can work with. So anyway, and then what we realized? We realized the following. The heology, those two terms that we, the, the, only, the first thing we try to put here is, the, is, the, is a, a dumped oscillator, you know, the harmonic oscillator with a damping. Doesn't, you cannot fit anything with that. Earth. But you can do more or less a reasonable job with this geological model. So this is a, this is a, a, a if you open a, a, a book on, on, on linear viscous elasticity, they, they present you lots of these diagrams. There's the spring dash pod models. And it took me some time to understand this has, you know, this has a, a, a nice physical meaning. Because you, you, you think about this one dimensional model, and then you make a hypothesis that we also did, that you have an isotropic Earth, right? Isotropic, not, not homogeneous, huh? but isotropic. That's more or less true, more or less. Also not true, but anyway. But we do this approximation, we have to do. And then you, you, you take this one dimensional picture, and you can pass it to the three dimensions. We, we do this, and it's a big part of the paper, in fact. 10 pages to, 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 to explain this and to do this. Anyway, but it, it's doable. But anyway, but from, 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 it's easy to explain. Because let's take the Earth. 
Why do we model the Earth? This, this, there are two diagrams here. One is this one. This is only the rheological part of the Earth. More or less, how, how, does, how, how the Earth behaves and, under and, uh, periodic forcing. And this is, I'm sorry, and this has a, an extra an element, this extra spring that I will explain later. But the point is the point. Suppose that the Earth has these two uh, springs and these two tempers arranged in this way. Suppose that this, and this is the case more or less for the Earth, is a, is a, is a hard damper. In other words, if you have high velocities, it's so, you know, this, the, damping, the damper coefficient is so in great that this, this arm doesn't move, essentially, under, under high, high frequency oscillators. Well, suppose this damper is much softer, and also this spring is much softer, in some sense, or can be comparable to this. But anyway, when, when you move this, this, this point, this part of the diagram, only the spring moves, because it's very hard to, 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 to how you say, to displace this, this damper, to deform this damper with a, with a high frequency excitation, because the velocities are high. And, and it doesn't like high velocities, this damper, because it's too hard. This is softer. So this one deforms a lot. And in the Earth, the, the, uh, it's this, these two dampers, they play the role of the solid Earth, this one, and the oceans. So the oceans, since the, the, this damper is softer, this new one is, is smaller, it deforms. So at the end, it, it, it dissipates much more energy than this one under, under uh, uh, periodic forcing on the periods that the, 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 uh, related to the rotation of the Earth. But anyway, this is a technical detail. But anyway. But another point important here that shows that this type of diagram, they, it, it has, uh, you, you, using these diagrams, or using these, these, these schemes, these models, you can, you can dissipate a lot in some frequencies that you cannot dissipate in others, and etc. Because suppose now you put a static force here. What does a static force do with this, with this, the, the spring? dashpot system. It just, you know, if you put a static force here, this will move forever to, to, the, to the infinity. Because you see, first of all, it's static. You know, these dampers, they, they cannot resist to a static force because the force that they, 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 they resist is to the changing the velocity. So it's new times x dot, the velocity. So at the end, you know, this cannot resist to a static force. So what's this extra spring that we put here? This extra spring is the gravitational force. Because if the halogen of the Earth cannot sustain this very slow motion, forcing, the, the, the gravitational constant can. And this is very important in our model, because the Earth is rotating. The Earth is rotating. So it's more or less steadily rotating. So this causes a centrifugal force to the Earth that deforms the Earth. This is the polar flattening. And at the end, Newton computed the polar flattening again. How did he compute? He thought that the Earth was a perfect fluid. Did a hydrostatic computation. And made a mistake. That's not very large. I don't remember 20%, 10%. So, so he got more or less the answer. And it's incredible that if you do more sophisticated computation, you see that the Earth behaves as a, 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 exactly as a, 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 a perfect Fluid. You know why he didn't get the, exactly the correct answer? Because he considered there was a homogeneous distribution of, 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 of ideal fluid. And in fact, you have a density. The worst is not, you know, has the same density. But if we did a computation as we did in our paper, you get essentially the, the result that's no. So for static forces, for static forces, the Earth behaves as a perfect fit. So the, 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 no. The, the, the solid part or the ocean, whatever, they cannot resist to static force, essentially. Or if, if they resist, you know, it's negligible compared to the forces that we, we have it here. So, so at the end, the final model we use in our simulations to, to, and to fit the, 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 the real Earth data is this. It, of course, the Earth is very complicated, really. So you, of course, this is not perfect. But for celestial mechanics, from the celestial mechanics point of view, the evolution of the moon, Earth, sun system, it's, I think, it's, it's reasonable. And finally, let me finish. I, my time is over, right? Uh, let me go to the conclusion. Well, so uh, what are the advantages of our model? 
well, fr from infinitely many degrees of freedom of the continuum, in principle you have, right, because the Earth is an extended body, uh, we only retain three, pos three degrees of freedom, the position of the center of mass, the angular orientation, and the formation variables that I just said. So we reduce the system of PDEs in principle that many people use, in fact, this system of PDEs coupled with point masses, to a system of 22 ODs for each body. If you have two bodies, 44 ODs. So it's not also, you have to use the computer to solve, right? And if you have three bodies, 132 ODs and whatever. The equation still conserves the overall angular moment in spite of the energy being dissipated. And why does it conserve angular momentum? Because when you do the Lagrangian modeling, this is the reason we chose the, Lagrang we chose the Lagrangian modeling, is you preserve the, 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 the constants of motion, the invariance of, of, of the system. Third, the model is fully 3D and couples naturally rotation, translation, and deformation because the traceless part of the inertia tensor was used as a deformation variable. So anyways, since this traceless part of the, of, the, of the inertia tensor appears in the Lagrange, it couples everything, essentially, naturally. So you have a coupling, so you have the couples equation. I, I'm writing this because, of course, this is an old problem. Let me just tell a little about history. The great, greatest contributions were given by Newton itself, Laplace, ocean tides, and Darwin, this guy, George Darwin. And so there are lots of models, but people suffer to get good models for, for planar motion. In other words, you have, oh, and you have all the planets and, and the satellites in the same plane. Then they have models that are, 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 are quite reasonable because, because, the, because they can handle this, the, the rotation part. That's the most complicated part. First, in these models, they don't have the diurnal modes of the tides, only the, the, the semi-diurnal. So for, so for natural, for, for planar systems, there are many models, and, and they, are, they, are, they are essentially, uh, for practical reasons, they are good. But in three dimensions, then things are more complicated. Uh, well, here the reference, because I worked on this with my students. Still, we are still working on, on this. Now we, we, we are a couple of astronomers, right? people in the world, more professionals in celestial mechanics. So and so yeah, we're still it's a, it's a work in progress in fact. So thank you very much. <laughs>